afternoon, especially after a very heavy lunch, is how to keep people awake. The second thing is, I'm in the presence of two distinguished doctors who have done a lot of research in their subjects. Basically, one, Dr. Fatima, who I would say she is the encyclopedia about the culture of Goa. And the second, who is involved in a lot of research for universities, who understands the psychology of women. I see a lot of women here. Uh, you all are either going to shoot me after this talk or agree with me and I look forward to that in the give and take session at the end of it. The second part is uh, for the men, don't go back after that and say, oh, my wife or my ex-girlfriend was like this. Because we're going to spend the afternoon dissecting my first novel. Now, she said I wrote 11 books, it's a fact. But I was always prone to write food, or uh, I mean books on food. I was considered to be a food writer. After my book won the international award in 2008, I had a choice. What type of book do I write? And I can see a lot of youngsters here. I'm sure a lot of us also are in that sort of crossroads. Where do, does your writing take uh, place or how does it take place? From 2008, this story, six chapters, was lying in my, on my computer, untouched, because I did not know whether I could go ahead with it. They say that the years give you a lot of experience, you know exactly how to take a subject forward. So this book, which is very captivatingly titled The Shadow of the Temptress, basically I call it a tri-dimensional book. Because the book goes deeply into number one, the psychology of four women. The era, which I found very difficult to catch, was 1912. The story moves from Goa to Bombay. And I know I've got a lot of people from Bombay. I just met one old school friend, at least we were in the same school compound. And she's promised me that she's going to give me a hard time after I talk about this. But anyway, so we were talking about these four women. Now all over India, women were supposed to be subjugated, not heard, not seen. And when I heard this story, which is inspired or based on a true story, a true life story, about this one man, I would not consider him weak because he had an opinion of his own. But it traces his life from the time he was a 15 year old youth. It traces his life in Goa in 1912 till he's forced to run away because of the environment. And that environment basically is caused because of the women. And he's forced to run away to Bombay to seek his fortunes as many other Goans in the past was wont to do. So the first part of it tells you the deep, which a lot of us are nostalgic about, the culture of Goa. How did really people live? That was the first part of it. There were traditions, there were beliefs, uh, the way of life in villages. The second part is delving into the psychology of these four women who affected this poor guy. And the last part of it, which at the end of writing this novel, I realized this is a lot of questions which keep on perturbing the people who are now living in Goa. Does history really repeat itself? Because when I was doing a little research, I found out that even way back then, maybe I'm going to ask Fatima for the years, they say, or it was historically believed, that the city of Panjim was built on opium money. And also, there was a lot of historical fact that people lived and were very status conscious in terms of, okay, was I a Brahmin or was I a Gauda? And depending on the status consciousness of people, do they still believe in that uh, Believe in that today in Goa? And as I was writing this book, these little thoughts kept on popping up. Yes, I'm delving into unknown territory. I tried to visualize out from my crowded uh, room in Porvari, which is now a mini Bombay or Pune. And I tried to imagine the green fields and the mangoes hanging laden, uh, you know, hanging from the trees and you had them in red and green and yellow and orange and the jamuns which were so ripe and luscious you could just pick it off the trees. I was trying to imagine creative descriptions. 
And at times, I just had to say, okay, tell my hubby, who's my publisher, I said, let's take the car and go into an unexplored area of Goa. Maybe I'll get a sense of what it used to be. Because Goa has changed so drastically. Then there was that lifestyle. Yes, the cities and the towns in Goa today are becoming a little more cosmopolitan. But there was a time when the poder, the bread man, would be outside every house on the pretext of giving bread, but his ear would be there listening to the Balkan gossip. And he didn't need postmen at that time. He would move from one place to the other, basically, uh, you know, catching all the information and all the poskares. Again, there's a little bit of, I don't know how many of us have heard of his poskares. But again, they were supposedly, in the past, the illegitimate children of the Barkas, the big men who lived in these big houses. Now these were a lot of stories and my son being a Goan basically would ask me, Mom, is it true because everything in Goa is so changed, I don't uh, see anything of that. So I'm saying supposedly, allegedly, I'm going to speak to Fatima to find out if there is some truth in that because this is the story as was told to me way back in 1980. I'm going to stop first at the culture because I do hope I'm true to form when I'm going to read to you a basic description of a, the Catholic symbol. The book encompasses the different communities. They all lived in communal harmony. We had the Hindus, we had the Catholics, there was a little bit of the Jews and that's why we spoke about the history of the Gasha, the author, it's a beautiful garden in Panjim and basically how it was named after a Jew who basically I am given to understand uh, body was exhumed because they came to know after that during inquisition that he was a Jew. Now these are all the things which were basically existing in Goa and somehow or the other they were brought they were brought alive in this novel which I happened to put through. It is a little description of what I call the big bhatka. When you are a bhatka or a landowner. That again depended on what was your status and how you lived. So here is a little bit of a description of the big Barca. Marcus entered through the metal gate which was held open by a livery attendant. He cast a quick backward glance at the opposing statues of the two lions that stood like silent sentinels on each portal. He limped up the imposing steps slowly holding on to his heavy crutches for support. He entered to hear voices drifting from the main hall. In this long rectangular room, the wooden floor was three times as long as it was wide and was wax polished. The high decorated ceiling was also higher than its width. And suspended from there with big metal rings were three chandeliers, each holding 15 candles. They blazed brightly, dispelling the darkness around. Unlike the solitary, stubby candles which were placed in old bottles in the D'Souza house. The windows were along one side, big open French windows with frescoes detailed above by some unknown Hindu artist. Heavy velvet curtains were draped from rods uh, below these uh, etchings. At intervals, to enable ease in conversation, carved teak and rosewood furniture were placed in a semicircular fashion. The rich upholstery added to the majestic splendor of the room. Now this was in the village of Pasagao. Today it is also still known as the village of flowers because it's a beautiful, beautiful village that exists. And this is the, the houses which basically the people or the hero of my book actually lived. So now that was a big bar car, I'm talking about a description of a small bar car. Not as wealthy, not as status uh, level as far as the previous one. I'm home, shouted Sebastian as he pushed at the wooden slatted gate at the entrance of his house. The hinges creaked, protesting a reminder that a liberal use of coconut oil was needed to ease its movement. But Sebastian paid no heed. He let the gates hang open with a deep-rooted conviction that Rosemary would definitely rush to shut it after him. This was to keep the stray cattle from devouring the flowering bushes that lined the pebble driveway. That was the role of woman in my house after all, he muttered to himself. The boss cares Rosemary and Santana had lit the candle 
glasses mounted on glass bottles on the window sills of the sala. The feeble flickering glow attracted fireflies that clustered and buzzed around it. From the kitchens at the rear of the house, a tantalizing aroma of fish and bimli curry wafted through the open window. Sebastian looked forward to the street. Rosemary must have sold some extra coconuts at the market. Mai's recipe for the fish curry with unpolished rice from their very own fields, which locals call shit pony, was par excellence. Now, two families living in the same village, they were both of the same level, which we used to call the Bhomans or the Brahmins. Uh, I'm going to leave that at this point of time because I'm going to have a discussion with Fatima about this way of life. And I'm just going to talk about the second part, which I'm talking about the four women who affected Sebastian's life. When I told somebody, I'm writing about a man and four women, the first question I was asked, oh, was he Muslim? And I said, no, he did not have four wives. These are four women in his life who affected him. Now the first woman was his mother. Like all strong women in Goa of their time, because uh, she was a woman where her husband left everything to her. Her name was Perpetua. She was his mother. Only one thing she could not control, and that was the drink where her husband was concerned. So she took to spiritual intervention. She spent a lot of time in the church. And the man, to keep his mind free, said, okay, let me leave the house in her hands. And he'll spend a lot of time outside the house. She controlled all the women in the house and treated her son in a, in a very, very disciplinary mode. Later on, it came to know maybe she was scared that the boy would follow his father's footsteps. And that's why he, uh, she behaved in that way. But this sort of put a sort of a negative uh, effect where the boy was concerned of spending any time in this home. He grew to hate this home. And that was one woman. The second woman was a woman 10 years older to him. And he was innocent. She was a daughter of a doctor, middle income person. She married into money. But her tastes were insatiable. So her husband went to Aden to earn some more money to keep her lifestyle the way she wanted it. She was lonely in the village, so she spent a lot of time in just, you know, free, uh, in flirting around with a few of the well-known guys, flirting, nothing naughty. She found this boy interesting, she pulls him on, puppy love, he falls in love with her, and she leads him on and just leaves him after a few years. He's devastated. Later on, they find out that his father had basically let her down. So this was a sort of a revenge which was taking place. He runs away to Bombay because he cannot stand the gossip and all that which was going to take place uh, in the village. And when he goes to Bombay, he realizes it's not very easy for him to find a job. Yes, it was steaming with mills and workers. He was given a chance to stay in a food, but the reason why he doesn't because his pride and ego says I want nothing more to do with it. So he goes and stays in a chore. In the chore, he real, realizes what hardship. You're showing two countries, England and uh, Go uh, Goa, in two different avatars during the same period. And then he realizes he has to marry money. Now, in those days, there used to be a sort of unknown sort of a diktat that if the woman was not so attractive, there was always a dowry place for her hand. And he meets this man who has two daughters, one very pretty and one who was uh, not so pretty and had a chip on her shoulder where she was considered to be the wallflower unless she got married. So she basically was getting very worked up about all that and that marriage was doomed from, from the start. They were not able to communicate with each other. She leaves him, she comes to Goa. So someone turns around and tells her, please go back to uh, Bombay, she's having an affair with the auntie there. Uh, sadly, her husband's having an affair with the auntie. Here again, we're drawing a parallel parallel to the way aunties used to run taverners in Bombay vis-a-vis -vis the open taverners to have the tavern go up. It was like chop and cheese and yet many Goans moved out of Goa and went into Bombay. His life was miserable. She controlled her children. She mentally, uh, uh, like to say, it was verbal uh, harassment where the kids were concerned that they began to hate their father. There was only one person who she could not control that was her daughter who adored her father. And that itself was not giving the wife, Miriam, a chance to break that bond between the husband. It was her power in the home. And ultimately, 
the, uh, the father marries the daughter off because he needs the money to buy a cow without past marrying it, uh, working in Kuwait. He gets the money, in other words, he sells his daughter, but his daughter still loves him. Daughter falls in love after some time with a man who's not a her forecast. Honestly, it sounds like something out of Bollywood, but it really was a true story. So I'm stopping at this point of time because there were many, many events which were inspired and I'm going into discussion with my two doctors here. Fatima, I'm going to start with you because if you take the mic. I just have to ask you this question. You've done so much of research when it comes to Goa, its lifestyle. Now somewhere I heard that in the olden days people would offer cucumbers to the church. The tradition being that hopefully they would be blessed with a body baby boy. Is that a fact? Yeah, they still do it. They still do it? Uh, at Kurka, uh -huh. Santana, uh, the church of St. Anne, uh, on the last Sunday of, uh, of uh, July. Priest of St. Anne, sometimes it's in the early August, but usually last Sunday of uh, July, the Priest of St. Anne, Mother of Mary, uh, hundreds of people go of all religions go there and they offer the cucumbers uh, yeah. as food for the child. It's called the Tosha Chifes. Tosha Chifes. And uh, you know, there's a saying. Toma pipinu itami minin means take a smaller than the tosha pipinu. It's called in Portuguese. Itami minin minin means give me a child. So okay. it's safe and Now, as you know, when I hear all this, it's just like what I wanted in the third part of my book, which is history repeats itself. In fact, there are so many of these traditions which, uh, you know, are slowly being forgotten by the modern generation, but yet, in deep down in the villages, these are the things which are still believed. The second one which I heard, now this is not related to the Catholic side of the family, it's related more to the Hindus uh, which live in total harmony in Goa. But if they wanted to curse somebody, they would cut a fox's head and that blood was sprinkled on the gate of uh, the person who they wanted to curse. Was, is the, was that something? I have heard about it but I have never seen or witnessed something like that. Okay. I have heard that they do it still. Alright, so this was another thing which was told to us about this sort of a pagan system which existed. Honestly, even I have not seen it. This is what I have heard about. The third part which again someone told to me that there used to be a lot of possessions where the spirits would enter into the body of people and uh, it was either a special person was brought for the exorcism or a priest, a local priest would get involved. Would that happen in the past? Part of something they call it part. Yeah. If they people would get possessed, or they believe that people got possessed. Don't say either, did you? Don't say either. Don't say either. Don't say either. For those who don't believe it, don't say either means the devil has come within you. Now, for us modern people, it might not really sound uh, uh, factual, and I have not seen it. I'm sure these ladies have not seen it. But these are the stories which we have heard, and the beliefs still exist in villages. Another thought, I don't know if uh, I've not discussed this before, but they should turn around and tell me that if somebody had a black tongue, that's a spot under the tongue, whatever was said by that person would honestly come true. Is it a fact? No, I don't. Yeah, I've heard this and I have also experienced it. Wow, you have? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's interesting. I have a cousin who has got a black tongue. So, you know, we tell him, don't say anything bad. Just like, good come out of your mouth. Because sometimes when he says, no, this is not going to happen, and it did not happen, you know. So, I don't know whether it was really that or what it was. So, the interesting part of it, now we are, I would say, Gen X who are living in war today. And I'm talking about a story which I've written way back in 19, which people had said in 1912. So, a lot of these beliefs which uh, did exist then are still existing uh, today in terms of that. Now, okay, now this is as far as the beliefs are concerned. I'm coming to the psychology of women, right? I have explained these four women and both of you all have done a lot of work when you understanding and research of women. Do you think that sort of scenario would have presented itself in Goa in, in that era? Why not? Well, there were four different women and all four reacted or he reacted to them in a different way. 
when you do have dominating mothers, you know, and uh, they say that sons are very fond of their mothers, you have the lecture complex and things like that. But uh, sometimes, as you say, her husband was a drunkard and, you know, she never wanted this boy to become like that. So she would be very dominating and, you know, be behind him all the time to see that nothing goes wrong with this boy and uh, he doesn't follow his father's footsteps. So, and sons are very close to the mothers, but then this domination, I suppose, he couldn't take it. You know, it was a bit too much. He was not allowed to grow because if you live in a uh, society or in a household like that, you can never be yourself. So he could never be himself. So that made him, I suppose, run away or whatever it is. All right. And what so, about the second woman? The second temptress? In his okay. Life. The second woman. Yeah. Should you call her a temptress? Uh, would you call a man a temptress? Uh, something like that. If he had to do the same thing. No. A man who has a lot of relationships. Okay. He's macho. Okay. And a woman who. And a woman who has a lot of relations, uh, relationships. Oh, you would uh, term her as a prostitute, or you would term her as a temptress, or something like that. But sometimes there is something deep within them which makes them do something like that. Now, as you said in this case, this uh, she I mean, it, it was revenge. Church. Yeah, because she had an affair with his father, and it never matured into anything. So I suppose maybe you know here's a young boy, vulnerable, ready to come, and she just had an affair with him, and maybe it was some sort of a revenge. Well, you would get women like that anywhere also. Yeah. Madam, I'm going to throw because I think both of you are love for co-op. Yeah. You're never know, born and brought up. Yes. Was there always this sort that plain looking women would find it difficult to get husbands? Did people have this sort of a hot behind in families? Yes. In those days, yes. Yeah. But not today. Today, a plain looking woman, I mean, looks at the, don't matter. You can be smart and get a husband. I mean, nobody goes to see your looks. People don't marry for looks. At least I hope not. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that won't last too long. But, uh, I mean, it should be compatibility. Mentally, you should be able to be together. You know, those things are more important. I don't think uh, looks are very important. But in those days, yes, plain looking women, I mean, they would keep a special dowry for them because, you know, we don't know whether we... And the ultimate was marriage. Today, the ultimate is not marriage. You don't really need to get married. A woman doesn't really feel the need that she has to get married. I mean, you can be smart and lead your own life and I really respect people so like that. So, the dowry thing actually what yes. has told to me that yes. happens. Some, uh, because a friend of mine once, long, long ago, told me, you know, he says, this daughter of mine doesn't look so good and I'll always give her some more, you know, so that she can get a husband. So yet so in, a, in a very liberal society in Goa, where women were not considered to be the, uh, you know, the subjugated uh, yeah. person in the house, yes. but these sort of inferences would exist in the house. Yes, these inferences were there, they were there even when we were children, like, you know, um, I still remember my mother, of course, came from a very affluent family and, uh, I mean, she was educated. But she always told me, your brother has to come home, I can come late. He'll have a punch, he's a boy. So you are a girl, so you must be home by seven. You know, those things were there. And I remember always arguing with her, why? If he can come at nine, why not I? But All those right. things So were there. those were the norms which yeah, really yeah. existed and we had to conform to the norm. That's yes. what I'm saying, yeah. and it's my now I did end up with the last lady before we open and that is the daughter. We are talking, yes, goals, again correct me if I'm wrong, I'm stepping into uh, dangerous waters, but this is the mind of that goal family. Uh, when it came to marriage within the family, they would rather have, because this last daughter who fell in love with a Hindu, she was too scared to bring the fact home to her parents and to her father who really adored her. Do you think, though, on, on the surface, we never did differentiate between the Hindus and the Catholics? Deep down in our own families, we were very reserved in terms of accepting maybe people of the other caste. Yes. Yes. It, it did yes. happen. Yes. Because even, okay, in today's world and age, it, it's a little bit uh, different, but yes. these are the things which used to happen. In a way, I'm quite happy that uh, I have you all because I didn't. Now get in touch with them when I was writing the book. It was because I just wanted it to be as factual the way it was told to be and not a researched book. So it was people's feelings 
things that were coming through at that time, what they believed in, how they wanted to live their lives, the, the Brahmins and the different levels which were there. And also we touch a lot because we're moving from Goa to Bombay and it took a lot of research on my part to sort of understand, not the real historical research, that okay, this is a Goan family, but we're talking about the Hindu Goans, we're talking about the Christian Goans, we're talking about the Portuguese Goans, the ones who were the upper big Bhaktas. And then we moved into Bombay where we touched a little where he was befriended by a Muslim Bora family. And then we also go into the Parsis because the Parsis were great philanthropists during that time and they were all begging backwards to help a lot of people. The whole story is from 1912 to 1955, Old Goa to Bombay. I, when I was doing this, especially funerals which are so important in Goa and I was trying to find out how did a funeral take place in Goa? Was it a gun carriage, which was done for the upper level people? Was it the pole bearers, because that showed respect? Or was it just a handcart, if it just had to happen? Or people had to travel from Bombay to Goa, and they could not use the, the, uh, the boat, as in Sadi's case, because he had to run out of the country. How did he really travel? There were so many things which were, you know, troubling, uh, you know, am I really going on the right path? It was like a hit and miss. I did speak to a lot of old people. And when I brought one problem, like I said, this book exposes all. I said, all right, there were court cases in the past. There were court cases in the past. Did it really happen in Goa? And one old lady turned around and said, please, I don't want to talk about it. What happened was happened. We will not talk about that. But anyway, thank you, my friends. Fatima, I don't know if it's right or wrong. They're both smiling, these ladies. Uh, but I will now ask you all. I've done a little bit of a We are smiling because court cases still exist in families in Goa. Why? 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 Why?